somewhere. And so his driver was taking him to the airport and they left pretty early. So the Pope said, you know, I haven't driven since I became Pope and we got a lot of extra time. Do you mind if I take the wheel and drive around a little bit? We couldn't say no to the Pope. So he says, okay, go ahead. So they switched places, they pulled over, switched places. Pope starts driving around. He is pretty rusty because he doesn't drive, so he's a little erratic with his driving. And he notices flashing lights in the mirror. He pulls over. Police officer comes over and sees who's at the wheel. He says, pardon me, sir, just wait here a minute. He goes back to the car and radios the, you know, the headquarters. He says, I got a situation here. He said, I pulled over a car and it's somebody really important. And, and his boss uh, says, well, what is it, like the governor or somebody? He says, no, bigger than that. He says, well, is it some kind of celebrity? He says, no, bigger than that. He said, well, who is it? He said, I don't know, but the Pope is his driver. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be an important guy to have the Pope driving you around, right? This is Pentecost Sunday, and this is a Pentecostal church. If you, if you know what that is or don't know what that is, we're going to find out here. And so what does that mean? What does Pentecostal mean to you? Are you Pentecostal? The world thinks that we're tongue-talking, snake-handling, poison-drinking, holy rollers. <laughs> That's what a lot of people think about us. I was going to bring a little rubber snake. <laughs> that would be funny. Well, we don't handle snakes. Actually, it's not illegal. That's not legal in Pennsylvania. West Virginia, I think, is the only place where they're allowed to do that. And there's two churches down there that actually do that. And they've been bitten a few times. That's crazy. But that's the impression a lot of people used to have, at least about Pentecostals, about us. Um, I can remember when I was a kid, re people referring to Pentecostals as holy rollers. I can remember my mom and my grandfather talking about the holy rollers in a sort of a derogatory way. And now I are one. <laughs> so what is it that I are? So the word, the English word Pentecost comes from a Greek derivation of the word meaning 50 or 50th day. Pentecost was the beginning of the festival of weeks, which was to be celebrated seven weeks or 49 days after the end of Passover. This is in the Hebrew tradi tradition. This was an important festival and it accounts for the makeup of the crowd that was in Jerusalem at that time. So what happened? Here it is in Acts chapter two, the first four verses. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. In the King James, it says, in one accord. How they could all get into that little Honda. I don't know. But they were all together in one accord, in one place. The accord means they were all in agreement. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It was the sound uh, in the King James of a rushing mighty wind. It was the sound. It wasn't the wind. It was the sound. That whooshing, roaring sound. And then they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That was the beginning of what we call Pentecost. So who were these people? They were Christian disciples. They were the followers of Jesus. They were people of prayer. They were obedient, faithful Christian people. They were those who needed the empowerment of God. People had, they had a task they were just like us. What happened? Before the disciples, before this, they were cowering in fear. 
Jesus was gone. They had seen him horribly treated and crucified. Then they knew he came back to life. He appeared to them many times. And now they saw as he was taken up into the clouds. So now what? Would they be next? The temple rulers would like to stamp out their faith. Would they come after them? There was a promise in Luke 24, 45 to 49. Jesus said, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He opened their minds. Have you ever had that happen? Sometimes you read a passage over and over again and all of a sudden it jumps out at you. Wow. I've read the entire Bible 28 times in 28 years. But I see, I see a scripture. Wow, I never saw that before because he opens your mind to that and you need to know that for some reason. So he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Stay in the city, tarry. That's the word in the King James, tarry. That means wait for the power. They were powerless by themselves up there. They didn't know what was gonna happen, but he instructed them to stay in the city, not leave, and wait for the power. The empowerment came to them with that baptism in the Holy Spirit. Peter wanted right out and preached a sermon. He wasn't an orator. He wasn't a trained speaker. He was a fisherman, sort of a coarse person they were. It was a Galilean fisherman. Sometimes they were looked down on in Jerusalem because they weren't you know, fancy scholarly people. He was very ordinary. He didn't even prepare a text. He just went out and started preaching. The power came on him to preach with that spirit baptism. His spirit, complete with scriptures and powerful, uh, was powerful and effective. And 3,000 people believed in Jesus as Lord on that day and they were baptized in water. The Holy Spirit convicted them with his words, and the church was born on that day. And they said to him, they were cut to the heart, they said, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. That entire sermon is recorded in the book of Acts. There have always been people baptized in the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues since that day. Some would try to tell you that that was just something that passed. The Holy Spirit comes into a person when they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, because it says, know ye not that your bodies are temple of the Holy Ghost. But there have always been people and movements in which people desire a more powerful experience with God. In the early history of it, in the second century, the post-apostolic fathers, post-apostolic means after the apostles were gone, they spoke of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and of the exercise of spiritual gifts, which still happens today. The D-dash and Justin Martyr, I don't know what that D-dash is, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, and Justin Martyr, which was an early church father, also mentioned uh, with approval the gifts of the Spirit. They were writers of that time, which their writings still exist, including prophecy. Irenaeus, another early church father, testified to the existence of speaking in tongues, describing it as a sign of a Spirit-filled person. Celsus, a pagan, stated that Christians in his day spoke in tongues. A group called the Montanists 
emphasized the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. In the third century, Tertullian identified speaking in tongues as one of the marks of a true church. Novatian cited with approval the existence of tongues and other spiritual gifts in the church. Based on passages in, in Epiphan, Epiphan, Epiphanius and Pseudo, these are hard, Athanasius, they're Greek words. It appears that Sibelius received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Fourth and fifth centuries, Hilary and Ambrose taught in favor of tongues, but a little later, Augustine opposed, he called them heretics, who still taught that people spoke in tongues at conversion, which is not true. They don't speak at conversion. Both Augustine and John Christosom admitted that in former times, everyone who received the Holy Spirit spoke in tongues. But they argued wrongly that tongues had now ceased. In the Middle Ages, speaking in tongues was reported among, they called them heretics, the Catholic Church called them heretics, such as the Waldenses and the Albigenses, and also among the Franciscans and other mendicant orders of monks. In the 16th century, some Anabaptists spoke in tongues as did people in a prophecy movement in England. Menno Simons, the Anabaptist leader whose followers became known as Mennonites, described speaking in tongues as expected evidence of the Holy Ghost. And many early Anabaptists worshiped quite demonstratively. In the 17th century, speaking in tongues occurred among the Camisards in Southern France, the early Quakers in England, the Janesens, a Catholic, the ja Jasnentists, a Catholic reform movement in France, and the Pietists, including Moravians in Germany in the 18th century. Speaking in tongues continued in some of these groups and was also reported among the Methodists in England and America. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist, heard of speaking in tongues and defended it as a valid Christian experience for his day. The Wesleyan revivals were noted for physical demonstrations and repentance and worship. In the 19th century, reports of speaking in tongues grew more numer numerous, coming from among American revivals and camp meetings conducted by Methodists, Baptists, and some Presbyterians, Lutheran followers of Gustav von Bülow in Germany, Irvingites in England and America, Plymouth Brethren in England, readers in Sweden, they were called, revivals in Ireland, and holiness people in America, particularly in Tennessee and North Carolina. Our modern Pentecostal movement, all down through the ages, there were people filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was always with the initial evidence in speaking in other tongues. That's what Pentecost came to be, and it was there all that time. People say it ceased, but it did not. There were a lot of holiness movements springing up, and Many of them came from the Methodists, from the Presbyterians and Baptist churches. People were, in a word, hungry for God. They were tired of the excesses of mainline churches where the church was all about stained glass and all about the fancy vestments that the, that the ministers or priests wore. And church was about the church. And they were tired of that excess of the mainline churches, uh, they disapproved of the lack of simplicity and the growing wealth of these churches. They were, you know, the churches were serving the churches. It seems people wanted now to get closer to God. 
small groups of people. They wanted emotional worship. That's what Pentecostal worship is. That's why we raise our hands. Sometimes in services, people get excited because we're saved. We're on our way to heaven. Glory to God. And we get excited about it. Been in churches where they jump up and down. Not old people like me, but you can go like this. <laughs> I can't. But they wanted emotional worship. They wanted adherence to the Bible. They wanted excitement in their churches. So what was the holiness movement? How did it begin? This is the modern holiness movement. I mean, the, the modern Pentecostal movement. But during this time, Charles Parham, he was a holiness teacher and a former Methodist pastor. He thought, he taught a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, among holiness people. These were a sect of people, multiple sects, all in different parts of the world, who wanted to really connect with God and not just sit and read and sing and go home. They wanted an experience with God. And they, they believed in a second work of grace in which God would enable them to live holy. So that was this teacher, and, and they were, it was a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, and he assigned to the students to find out the scriptural evidence for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Remember, these people are praying, they're seeking God. And a student, her name was Agnes, Agnes Oseman, was the first of the students to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Meanwhile, William Seymour, a black holiness preacher, heard about the baptism in the Holy Spirit because it was popping up here and there in England and Ireland and Maine, different places. He heard about that in a Bible school that Parham conducted in Houston, Texas. He went from Topeka to Houston in 1905. And these were in Texas uh, racist times. But Seymour wanted to go and attend those classes. He had to put up with the indignity of sitting outside the classroom to audit the class. He put up with that for the sake of, of hearing about and learning about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Seymour's parents, his parents had been slaves. He grew up in a terrible poverty. He traveled and worked in several states. In Indianapolis, he got saved, asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. Then he joined the Church of God, Reformation, in Anderson, Indiana, which was a holiness movement. In just a few weeks, he learned enough about the baptism in the Holy Spirit to teach it himself, even though he had never received it, but he believed in it. So Parham and Seymour held joint meetings in Houston. With Seymour preaching to black audiences and Parham to the whites, a woman Seymour had met persuaded the pastor of a holiness church in Los Angeles to invite Seymour to preach a series of meetings as an evangelist. When he started to preach the Pentecostal message, they locked him out of the church. That was in February 1906. The leadership was suspicious of him because he was preaching something that he had not received. He had nowhere to go. So a bank janitor took him in. He attended a home Bible study and a prayer group in another couple's home on Bonnie Bray Street. Their hunger for God became intense. On April 9th, the janitor who had taken Seymour in received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. An outpouring started. Hundreds gathered. Seymour received it. 
on April the 12th. Finally, he received it himself. He preached from the porch of the Asbury's home. They couldn't fit inside the house. Quickly outgrowing the home, they had to search for a place, and they found it on Azusa Street. This is famous among Pentecostals, and the rest is history. They had a, a mission. I think it was a, it had been a livery or something. There was a sawdust floor, and they cobbled to get together some wooden benches. It was very humble and plain, but there was nothing humble or plain about what they were doing. They were empowered by God. Services were conducted three times a day, 10 a.m., 12 noon, and 7 p.m., seven days a week for three years. Seven days a week for three years. At almost every meeting, people were saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and many were healed and delivered from demons. People took this revival with them, and it spread around the world. That was the beginning of our Pentecostal movement. I have seen interviews with people, older people, who were at those meetings. You can find those on YouTube. They're older, they must have been real young when that happened, but they talked about how people got saved and how awesome it was. It's, it was just amazing. And uh, that address is still there, Azusa Street's still there, but that building, I think, has been demolished. So the promise of the Holy Spirit, Acts 1, 4 and 5, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. In Acts 1, 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Observe that these believers already had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because when you get saved, the Spirit comes into you. The indwelling comes at the moment of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from, uh, whom you have received from God? Romans 8 and 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit indwelling when you ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior. If you're born again, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have a measure of the Holy Spirit. The power, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is something else. It's especially empowering. It says you will receive power, Jesus promised. You will be my witnesses. Witnessing requires power. Sharing one's faith um, is, an, is accompanied by resistance. There's an enemy that doesn't want us to do that. And does everything he can to keep you from sharing your faith with other people. There's a resistance. The enemy doesn't want you to succeed in bringing light into this dark territory, which is his territory. So we feel funny, we feel weird. We think, you know, they'll think I'm weird if I start talking about Jesus. You have to overcome that with power, and that power comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peer pressure was invented by the devil. Peer pressure was. We need the power of the Holy Spirit baptism to overcome our fears, our hesitations, and boldly share our faith. And that's what these people did. There was a Christian diaspora. They went all over the, all over the um, known world. They went to Asia Minor, Turkey, and wherever Paul went, he would find some believers there already. But making a move is hard. 
You gotta move. You need power to do that, to talk to somebody about Jesus. And he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, referring to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, Romans 8, 26, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. There is a natural weakness when it comes to sharing our faith. There is a natural weakness to come from being, to, when it comes to being in God's will. The Spirit helps us overcome these weaknesses. Peter's life was transformed. It was made powerful as a witness by the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Remember, he was the one that denied that he even knew Christ. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. He was the one that denied that he knew anything about the Lord. And now, I don't know how many days later, I don't know how many days later, but he's out there preaching a sermon and wins 3,000 souls. Forsake the things you cling to and embrace the new. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Paul's baptism in Acts chapter 9, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. I believe that this verse refers to Paul's baptism in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 9, 22, he says, Yet Saul, this was before this happened, he grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus. Oh, this was after that happened. By proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He got the power to do that from the Holy Spirit. The command to be filled, Ephesians 5, 18 and 20. Do not get drunk on wine which leads to, to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, be filled with the Spirit, making music to the Lord, praising God, often brings the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in to other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There's no getting around it. The evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues. You can't speak in tongues without speaking. <laughs> you just don't control what it sounds like. That's a barrier that people have a hard time getting past. But those who really, really seek God, really, really seek God and want that experience. That first, that first baptism in the Holy Spirit, uh, those people were speaking in languages that the other people in Jerusalem could understand because <clears throat> there were people for that festival that was going on from other parts of the world from that could speak Greek and Aramaic and Latin, other languages. And they said, how is it that we all, they could all speak Hebrew because they were all Jews. How is it that we can hear that message and so can you and so can you, but, they're, but it's being spoken, how, do, how is that? So that is one type of tongues that still happens. And the early, the early Pentecostal churches thought they could do what they called mission tongues. They thought they could go on a mission field and speak in tongues and the natives 
would be able to hear and receive the gospel. And that didn't happen, except there were a couple of cases where it actually did happen. But speaking in tongues is you don't know what you're saying. And some people get a hang up. Well, do I have to know what the syllables are going to be before I speak them? Well, if you think you, you have to do that, but you just speak it out. It's just until you have it, it's hard to it's hard to understand that it's it's so it's so simple that it's baffling. <laughs> I mean, I was a chronic seeker for about a year. I finally just just relaxed and received it. But number one, God wants you to have it, to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the power that goes with it. Number two is you need to receive it. Number three, you have to want it and want it for the right reasons. It empowers you to understand scriptures more thoroughly. It empowers you to resist the, uh, the, the wiles of the devil, the fiery arts that, uh, darts that come at you, the, to resist temptation, to resist the devil. And the right, the right reason is that it gives you power as a witness. It, it helps you overcome that natural hesitation, that fear. So number four, you gotta ask for it. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And number five, you just receive it speaking in tongues. That can happen when you're driving down the road. That can happen when you wake up in the middle of the night. It can happen right now in church. Last year on Pentecost Sunday, we had two people there that got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're not with us anymore. But it's amazing what praising can do. But this emotional praise and worship we don't do so much of that here but we should <laughs> because that's Pentecostal worship you know but most of us are old and tired so we sit <laughs> and um, amazingly enough Nancy that she's 85 and she stands through a service and praises and worships and uh, anyway um, if there's anybody here that would like to be prayed for and with to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll take some time and do that. It's only 1145. But, but you need to, to, I think you need to anticipate that ahead of time and start praying that God will do that. And, um, but you can, you can do, you can be filled anytime if you're, you know, your heart's got to be in the right place. Lord, I don't want to, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the power for his glory. Not just because speaking in tongues is cool and everybody else is doing it. That's the wrong reason. That's the wrong reason. I want to, I want to um, gather around down here and pray for um, Sherry because she has the gout in her foot and anybody else that needs prayer this morning. And then if there's anyone who would like to be